Aloha, I'm Joshua Cooper. Welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around our world on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Moana Nui Kea. Today, we're looking at collective duty and solidarity for community in the face of climate crisis. UDHR, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 29, recognition and respect for all rights for all. I'm very honored to be joined by two amazing sisters of sustainability and solidarity from Latin America. Olivia and Peru being able to share with us a bit about the importance of the work that they do. And we know the Universal Declaration of Human Rights serves as a global agreement for us all, focusing on mutual respect for everyone, everywhere on earth. And we're here at the UN General Assembly High Level Opening Week and also the UN Sustainable Development Goals Summit, which provides the spirit of it's possible, as humanity marks the sustainability and solidarity agreements of the UDHR and the UN 2030 Agenda. And so far, 2023 is the hottest year on record ever recorded. The climate crisis is already threatening our collective existence with rising seas, melting glaciers, severe hurricanes, and wildfires. And the UN Sustainable Development Goals are at half time. We have seven years to accomplish the 17 global goals and continue up the new transformative tools, into, including the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, Paris Agreement, and most recently the adoption of a right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment as well as the Orhus and Eskazu Agreement. And Article 29 really does note our collective duties and responsibilities to our community. I'm so honored to be joined by our guests. Thank you so much for participating, Ida and Carmen. Ida, could you share with me, why is this issue so important in international human rights law? And can you share how this right is central in court in the global arena? Thank you. For the invitation, Joshua, I'm very happy to be here and share uh, some ideas about the situation of Peru and Latin America. My name is Aida Gamboa and I'm from DAR. It's Rights, Environment and Natural Resources. It's a Peruvian organization that promotes governance and human rights in the Amazon, in the Peruvian Amazon, but also we work with other uh, organizations in Latin America, in the Amazon a region and also in the global level. So we work in the territories with indigenous organizations in the local level and national level and also in these discussions at the national level. Uh, now, well, we are participating in this climate week in different events, but principally in events about financing, you not know, climate financing, carbon markets, uh, environmental defenders and also the situation about the Amazon, right? Uh, we know now, now in the Amazon, we have different threats. For example, for indigenous people, many indigenous people are too, because they defend their land, their territory. Every week on every month, there are a lot of indigenous in the Amazon that are threatened and also killed by, by their rights, no? by, because they defend their rights. So, uh, for example, uh, as we know, we have uh, a, a regional, uh, a regional convention, a regional agreement that is the discussion agreement that is about not only the protect the rights, no, also promote the access, information, participation, and justice in environmental matters. So, we try to connect uh, this legal agreement in the Amazon to these discussions in international level that the climate change, right? Now in, in this week, uh, for example, in, in about carbon market, the situation in Peru is, is very critical and also in different countries in Latin America, right? For example, numerous companies and intermediaries of carbon market uh, in the Amazon have been signed contracts with indigenous communities, organization under inequitable and unfair conditions, no? So these generate a series of place of indigenous people because they impact in their collective rights. And this is not being attended by the state, no? Uh, for example, the state in Peru and in other countries playing a passive role to establish a technical and legal conditions which should safeguards, participation, transparency, access to information, the respect of rights of the indigenous people. Uh, also, we don't have the uh, territorial legal security for these communities. Now we don't have a, a register of financing 
and also uh, a registry for projects of carbon markets. We don't have a mechanism of transparency of these type of projects, and, and also we don't have an effective mechanism of regulation, supervision, and sanctions, right? Uh, and these projects have been causing an social and environmental impacts you know, in these territories. So uh, this is uh, an issue you now in Latin America, in, and also, I, as I said, in the Amazon, we, we have uh, another, right? For example, uh, we promote recommendations for the states, for, for companies, and also for civil society organizations. For the state, we ask that uh, the states implement uh, platforms or guidelines you know, to applicate uh, safeguards and also register uh, these projects with information for communities and also implement mechanisms of distribution of benefits for communities. Uh, and also, uh, a one demand from indigenous organizations is to access direct finance, you know, because all these finances of climate change is going to the state or going to the private sector, but not for the companies, for the communities. You know? So the indigenous peoples demand that the uh, access to at least the, 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 the way the, the real way of financing of climate. So this financing needs to be the, with their own mechanisms, no? because also communities have their own mechanisms of control, no? of monitoring. So these mechanisms need to be articulated with the indigenous organizations in all ter in every territory. No? So this is uh, one recommendation and also uh, another recommendation is to implement a system of platform you know, of all these projects of financing and also for carbon market and promote a bit capacity building you know, to the organizations but because it's an opportunity to improve their organizations, to improve their lives and also to improve a, a better management of the funds of climate change. Excellent points, Aden. It's so rich to hear the work that you're doing in Peru and in the Amazon, and it very much links with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the UN 2030 Agenda, but definitely the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples with free, prior, and informed consent, because we know we wouldn't be in this predicament if the voice of Indigenous peoples was actually listened to and, most importantly, respected. So I thank you so much for those opening aspects. And Definitely the economic, social, cultural rights, but also the civil political rights you're describing and rights information in the Escazú Declaration is so rich. It's what we need to do to make sure that we ensure a, really an island earth for future generations. Carmen, can you share with us a bit about why this issue is so important to you in international human rights law and how this right central and core really not only to the global arena, but the powerful work that you do in Bolivia? Well, uh, first of all, uh, we have to acknowledge that we're facing three major planetary crises. One is climate change. We have seen what climate change is doing all around the, the world. And to understand climate change, we need to know the difference between global warming and uh, properly what is climate change. And global warming is when the Earth's atmosphere it gets heated up. And uh, climate change is because the climate is the mechanism that this, the atmosphere around the world has to lower the energy or the heat that's in the atmosphere. So what's happening is as our atmosphere gets more hotter and the temperature starts rising, then we're starting to see every time uh, more problems that, for example, wildfires. It has happened in Hawaii. It has happened in Canada. It has happened. It is happening right now in the Amazonian, in South America, in many places. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we need to talk about a broken uh, hydrical system. Uh, uh, our, uh, our water system is not, uh, it, it has been broken because we are overusing the resources and we are contaminating the, 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 the oceans 
and we're because of the heat is our our forests are also burning, which are the main sources reservoirs of water within the earth, and that's uh, the difference between salt water and uh, sweet water, and that's linked with the loss of um, biodiversity, the loss of uh, nature, and uh, wildfire uh, wildfires are one of the worst phenomena to get rid of uh, huge parts of biodiversity in very short time. So the amount of species that we have lost during this decade is going to be, uh, it's going to be huge. And many of them may be extinct like forever. So it's something to kind of like take into account. What do we do in, uh, to kind of like stop or uh, put a stop to this, to this or try to solve this crisis? And one is collective action. We need to be aware of what's happening, of what's going on, and uh, start finding solutions which can be, which should be transformed into uh, policies. Policies that include human rights, policies that understand that not only the Western way of life is the only way of life, but also acknowledges other types of, uh, of ways, ways of life. And at the same time, we need to guarantee human rights, human rights like for everybody, um, because we have to recognize that we're not, we are in a very connected planet like never before. And we have to acknowledge and keep on working on building global societies that are inclusive, but that recognize different ways of life. But at the same time, if we want to guarantee human rights, we cannot guarantee human rights if uh, our our rights depend on the suffering of other beings like animals, for example. So those are some of the points I would like to reflect on, and I'm happy to keep on discussing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carmen and Ida. It's an excellent introduction to this important issue, as really climate change is an existential crisis that we're all facing. And we really thought, of course, that it always happens to someone somewhere else. But what I think it shows with Hawaii as the most isolated landmass in the world, that when it's reached Hawaii shores, everyone is definitely susceptible and we must stand in solidarity together and stick up for one another because this is the only planet that we have. Maybe you could share with us about what first inspired you, Ida, to care about this issue and some of the first campaigns you're involved with. Thank you, Joshua. Well, I work in the you know, environmental issues and governance and indigenous peoples uh, since I have like 18 uh, years old. Now I'm 34. But one thing that inspires me is really the, the lack of right that indigenous people have in our territories, you know, in Peru and also in the other countries in the Amazon region. They uh, facing different uh, different threats, right? Uh, about their lives, uh, the 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 lands. So that inspires me to work in, in this on this, and also work to support their demands and um, their work, you no, know, in in their territories, supporting also the the work that they do to defend. Uh, the, the land, so th that inspires me to continue working on that. Uh, well, we have uh, different indigenous uh, indigenous uh, leaders that are killing Peru and also in the Amazon, so because their life, um, I'm continuing working, and also the organization that um the DART, not only support the organizations in territories. Now also we uh, make recommendations to the state and also to the companies, right? Because also they have a uh, important role in this environmental management, you know, in this process of climate uh, discussion. So not only the civil society, you know, the state and the, the private actors, all these actors have an important role if we have, if we want to a better life, a better, a better world, no? and also if we want to trans transition, not to a world with with uh, 
yeah, the use of better energies, no? Or, or clean energies, for example. So we, we have a lot of challenges in the, in the global discussion, but this discussion needs to aterrorize or need to share no, with the local level. So we, we don't connect the local level, the national level with this global discussion. We don't have an impact no, in, in the territories. So this is one reason that I, I see working. Um, but also uh, the, the local organization have their own mechanisms and proposals. For example, they do different protocols no? uh, in the previous consultation in Peru. Different organizations do their, their own protocols and say what they want to need to the this process or how this process needs to be uh, with better better mechanisms of governance of transparency participation so for example this is a, a an important experience you know in the in the previous consultation and many organizations have in Brazil in Colombia in Peru and, and Ecuador and also now in in this discussion of the carbon markets of finance climate change, they also propose you know, that they need to protocols or guidelines you know, that say that these finance need to go direct to the territories you know, and how we need to do that and what are the better uh, mechanisms that they use these finance to improve their lifestyle, right? Uh, and then I don't want. I want to say that what with Carmen and other organizations in Latin America, we also have. Uh, what we we did since I don't know eight years, no campaigns about the the signing first of the Escazú Agreement. We were part of the a network that is Escazú ahora. No, we are more than thirty organizations in Latin America. Uh, I think this is. One of the important campaigns that I'm participating in these years. So we support different countries in, in a regional level. And now we are, uh, we have 15 countries that are ratified the Casual Agreement. No? So we are part of this network and we are a lot of organizations that work in not only before the signing and the ratification, now we work in the implementation of the Casual Agreement. So we did a lot of work in communications, also talking with the governments in the negotiation. Then years ago, uh, so it's a, a good experience that we make, uh, we can do it in another space as well. Very inspiring. And it's also one of the things that we're looking at is to create a Pacific Escazu agreement that builds on what Orhus and Escazu has done. So it is expired, is very inspiring because we know if we don't really engage together and organize and ignite and unite, we could expire ourselves. So could you share with us, Carmen, what really inspired you and how you're actualizing Article 29 of solidarity and coming together of our collective duties and responsibilities? To our community, but also interspecies as well. Yeah, I think it's important to take into account that we're not alone in this planet. Sometimes, most of the time, we forget about that. We think that only pets are with us, and that's not true. There is a huge quantity of animals that aren't sharing this planet with us. And with many of them, we have a uh, and we don't have a link because actually they can they can transmit somatic uh, sickness, for example. But at the same time, we depend on them basically for me. And the solution is not well. One solution could be that we'll become vegan, but that's not going to happen. So uh, what we can do is to like reduce our meat consumption and. What we need is like 25 grams of uh, meat uh, a day that is transformed in eight kilos a year. So eight kilos, 10 kilos is something that 
uh, can help us achieve sustainability. And, uh, but at the same time, like South America, the average is 40 kilos of meat. There isn't like a global uh, the data around the global, but uh, we, it, it's one of the issues that we can do something and it's, it's in our plate. It's a right for food, it's uh, our so food sovereignty, but at the same time, our food has an impact. And it's a political decision, whether you choose or to have something grown organic or uh, whether you choose something that is coming from the big agro-industry that uh, it uses a lot of pesticides and a lot of chemicals. So uh, our choices matter, and I think it's important to work around that. And that is a way that everybody can fight and can work around rights in a, a very easy way and in a very everyday way. And I think that if we have more conscience about what our food is, but like from a political point of view, we can make better choices and not just wait until the next election to, okay, vote, which is great, but also to know what we're putting in our bodies and into our families. It really brings up a good point. The economic, social, and cultural rights are every day. The right to health, the right to housing, the right to education. If we don't have those fundamental freedoms and those rights, enshrined in our economic policies, then of course, none of us can really thrive. And as you pointed out, the civil and political, it's not as alluring to vote every four years, because in a way we can vote every day. And in some cases, two to three times a day with what we put on our plate. So we really appreciate that as well. And it's exciting to see how the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment has gained global traction, how we understand that we're on one island earth and we need to see what's going on. Maybe we could share together some of the champions creating a culture of human rights around these rights, but also your vision as well for the future of these important rights. Ida? Thank you, Joshua. I think that is important that civil society, you know, in the UNOS organization and the actors that are involved in this process, think about uh, not only this, this discussion, you know, make concrete proposals. No, uh, in a strategy or advocacy, no. For example, as I said, we have a, an experience in the Scots Agreement that we can apply, no, to do an advocacy uh, in different levels. No, first we have a national legis a strong national legislation that regulates, monitors, and sanctions uh, every bad practices and also regulate these projects or this financing or this initiative of climate change no? and also regulate better the compromises the, of the states, right, in the in climate, in climate change. Uh, second, we need to involve uh, not only the national governments, also the local and subnational governments, right, because they are in the territories and also they have an important role in this regulation. Uh, also, I think it's important to articulate with the initiative of the indigenous communities or the Afro-descendants communities, right? Because they also have their own mechanisms, their own proposals, they have their own initiatives, so they need, we need, uh, or the state need to articulate with, with this initiative and, and also uh, make mechanisms to improve the capacity building of these organizations, no? Because they are the, the the people that protect the land, the territory, the Amazon, for example, in, in the Amazon region. So they need more capacity building. They need more uh, funds no? to do this work also, and also they protect their life. So governments need to to have also a legislation and or protocols to protect their life because uh, all leaders and women for principle are killed in, in our territories in Latin America because they defend their lands, no? So it's important also to make, uh, to think about this and the situation not, not only is in, in the Latin America, no, it's in all the world because environmental defenders are killed because they defend their, their rights on, on their territories. So 
I think these are some points that we need to think in the future if we want to have a better world and we want that uh, have a better life. No? Very true. And really, environmental human rights defenders in Latin America, unfortunately, are leading in the category of being attacked and murdered by repressive regimes. In the Pacific, it's also a giant issue as well as we look at deep seabed mining and other challenges where we're trying to protect our really philosophy of Aloha Aina. Can you share with us, Carmen, maybe your vision of the future around this right and what we can do together to ensure the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda is a reality? And I do think that we have to keep on working on raising awareness. In Bolivia, for example, uh, we did the study around mercury with uh, an indigenous community. Uh, and then we explained them what mercury contamination was. And suddenly they realized what the danger was. Mercury comes from basically gold mining. So now the indigenous people are seeing the government, are kicking out the companies from their territory, are declaring their territory in, in mercury or gold free or gold mining free. And they're doing those steps because they understand that it's not about the resources, not about that they don't get the, the benefits around gold or around all this exploitation. But if we ignore the problems, we can be contaminated by uh, mercury, we can be contaminated by pesticides or plastics, but if we don't know what those things can, can do to ourselves, then it's really hard to take action. And at the same time, it is important to understand how climate change is impacting day-to-day -day our lives. And that, as you said, it's not something that is happening to our, our neighbors or to in somewhere in another part of the world. Is that's why it's important to teach with local, uh, with local policy, with national policy, and with international policy in order to achieve what is basic, not only human rights, thing. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate all the work that you do to ensure that the right to a clean, healthy environment is a reality. And really on the 75th anniversary of the UDHR and the half time for the UN SDGs, Article 29 really does confirm our commitment to community as the greatest hope for our future. And the UDHR insists individuals strive in solidarity to serve humanity and contribute to the culture of rights and resilience. And as we're battling from the wildfires on Maui and all the experiences you've shared with me during the time that we shared beginning in Korea at the border of the DMZ and the commitment to peace, all the way to the situation you're facing in the Bolivia, in the, in the high mountains, we know we are really one. And we have to, in a way, counter the cynicism, but also organize optimism and then harness hope together so we can sure that the world's a better place. And thank you for all that both of you do to make sure that the Excazio Agreement shines brightly for the rest of the world and builds on the tradition of the UDHR. Mahalo.